Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, so, uh, welcome everyone, and let me begin by gratefully acknowledging that we meet today on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people, as we do every day. Appreciate it. I'm Peter Berman, Director of the School of Population and Public Health. Welcome. This is our fourth in our series of Voices in Health this year. Um, and I just want to um, uh, just briefly note that we will be having the fifth in our series in January. Uh, Professor Prabhakaran from the Public Health uh, Foundation of India will be our speaker in January. Um, he is probably India's foremost expert on non-communicable diseases. And we'll be doing that uh, session jointly with SFU, uh, where he is visiting as a visiting professor starting in the new year for several months. So more on that as we communicate our agenda going forward. So uh, that's all from me. And I want to introduce Professor Patty Spittle, who's going to take us forward in our program today. Um, as Peter mentioned, my name is Patricia, and I'm a professor here in the School of Population and Public Health. Um, I was fortunate to travel back from Uganda for the kidneys and Herbert, um, and I'm delighted to introduce them. Dr. Katamba is a clinical epidemiologist and clinician um, with McCary College of Health Sciences. Um, he did his PhD training at Case Western. So he's used to the cold. Uh, but we've been really lucky with Dr. Katamba because he was a national football um, kind of hero when he was playing for the national team. And so he's kind of the mayor of Kampala. So when we need to get into ministry offices, we'll go things first because everybody knows that he was this famous footballer. Um, and he, he, he played football at the same time as he initiated his medical training, so it, it, that's pretty cool. Now, Herbert, um, we've been in uh, collaborations with Herbert since 1998, and or actually 94. We started work together in Rakai with HIV-related issues, and then we both went to northern Uganda to work on landmine-related issues um, together. So we've been working in northern, to, northern Uganda together for a year, probably. Yeah. Um, through the war and in post-conflict now. Um, Dr. Moyenda is the um, director of the Child Health and Development Center where he's co-PI with us on the Chango Edge study. Um, his work is in disability and HIV um, related vulnerabilities. Um, and he also did his PhD in a very cold place in Copenhagen. So <laughs> you'll notice that these guys have the coats and, the, and everything to, to mm. welcome our weather. So it's, it's with great delight that I introduce them to you guys. And I hope that this will be a really fruitful dialogue and that we'll have ongoing um, um, visits. And, uh, and it just helps a little bit with the jet lag, too, when you're suffering through it together. <laughs> so I can these. Please take it away. Oh, oh. oh. okay. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. I think so they want you to stand there. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Thank you very much for those kind words. And probably, it's not very cold in Vancouver. <laughs> 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 I think he, last time when I came here, it was actually, there was a PhD defense two years ago, and we were co-supervising Alfie in the mm -hmm. And it was quite cold that time. But as he said, I was in Cleveland, Ohio, Case Western, for about six or seven years. And sometimes I took advantage of the cold to learn a bit of skiing. <laughs> and then I went to run I skied sometimes. So I, it's not very bad. <laughs> I think UBC is like UC California, so we don't experience that. So maybe just to go to this, as you say, we have this talk which has got two components, HIV and HIV, implementation science research. We want to share something that we have learned over time. And I will be talking more in the area of 
still be, but how are we applied in implementation science to be able to make sure that to make sure that those interventions that have been proved to be effective here have the impact of our people in our populations. And before maybe I begin, I need to acknowledge that we are presenting today the unsealed of that. So that's a disclaimer that I wanted to put there. So in terms of the presentation, briefly just talk on what to understand as implementation science. And then talk about how we have looked at implementation science to improve the quality of TB care for the risk services in Uganda and HIV implementation science research than for Uganda that would be about given the presentation of that. So what is it that is implementation science from our understanding, which is really both from average or also to say there are many efficacious, efficacious interventions that have been put out there, and they could have significant health impact. However, many of them, as they are implemented in our settings, and as I will demonstrate from the work that we have been doing, they do not have the impact that we, we anticipate get from them. So there are a number of implementation problems, and so the work really is focused on looking at how do we overcome this implementation problem so that we have the impact in terms of the individual health and also the impact on the population. And so when you look at all these problems, probably, this is the intervention and we have a number of issues which may be looked at, economic, social, political issues, but there are also individual level issues individuals who have a role to play in the implementation process. But there are also process for implementation, methods used to facilitate adoption, and the inner circles context within the organization where that implementation takes place. So when you look at this, really, the number of models, but the CIFA, Center for Consolidated Implementation Research model, here it captures. And then we need to look deeper in each of these to see what do we need to address if we have to make sure that these interventions actually have impact that we think. And our work has focused a lot on that. And as you may be aware, this may be a reputation to many of you. Implementation here addresses proven health intervention that will not have expected impact because of implementation problems. And new infectious health interventions for which many <coughs> implementation problems are so here implementation science identifies and investigates problems to prevent effective implementation of interventions and also develops and tests implementation strategies that provide strategy guidelines. So here the focus is finding the test based solutions to make sure that these interventions are not given in examples the interventions that we have focused on over the past three years, three to four years with some of our colleagues. The work that I'm presenting today, probably, which is in press, it has just come out. This is the work that, as a, a team, we have tried to look at how to improve quality of care. So we have put together a summary of this, which is probably in press, and we will come out soon. Yeah. So, in tuberculosis, we know that a third of the patients worldwide are not being diagnosed or treated. And this is what is called the 3 million people, about 3 million people every year are not diagnosed. And part of that is like the test that we have currently, like the smear microscope, has been around for about 100 years. And probably it is only sensitivity is about 50%. And you find that also the patient has to come back to the unit here to be diagnosed the next day. And many patients fail to come back for diagnosis. So, of recent in the 2010, we got a chance that a new molecular test was made, the gene expert. And gene expert, a lot of 
money has been spent to make sure that we have been expanded everywhere. And Uganda is one of the countries that has tried to that we scale up this test. And as you can see, by 2014, almost 18,000 modules have been produced and about so many countries have been produced. So there has been a like scale up of this new diagnostics, which is really the intervention to improve our diagnosis of TB and bring people to care quickly. However, despite that so much impact, like in Uganda, so many tests have been really all these red points are where Guinea's art machines since 2013 have been deployed. And so when they were deployed, we found that actually there was increased number of TB cases that were diagnosed, confirmed to have been the TB. But there was minimal increase in the number of case findings that compared to what we see. And also there was so much increase in the proportion of cases diagnosed as we had expected. The issue is that this is a new intervention. <coughs> if used well, impact why and those are some of the implementation problems. So we yet went forward to say in that system of ours in Uganda, what happens? Not every health facility they can be able to afford to put a skin expert model. However, what is done, we have created a hub and model, hub and spoke. So there is a hub which is like a health center, a bigger health center. Then these other three to five health centers refer samples to this. So there is a border, border rider, a motorcycle rider, who picks samples from these units and takes them. Once tested, then the hub rider will bring back samples to that unit. Remember the patient provided a sample at the unit. The sample is taken. By the time the result is brought back, the patient will not be there. So the result has been found to be positive. So there is that sort of system to make sure that patients. However, this sort of how well that referral network is fast functioning to be able to initiate patients on treatment is not known. And the quality of diagnostic care within the, that referral network and what policy changes and co-interventions and further enhance expert in application implementation. So we went out to answer these three questions in over the past three or four years. And overall, these were the aims, really the study, we call them expert performance evaluation to facilitate linkage to TB care. We wanted to evaluate these two, the intervention expert, on how it ends up linking patients together. So we wanted to qualify, quantify what are the gaps in the diagnosis at these health centers linked, and then to identify any modifiable barriers to high quality TB diagnosis. And these barriers could fall into either provider level, patient level, or the systems level. And then based on those barriers we develop and test some theory driven interventions to improve the quality of diagnosis. And this work we have been doing together with stakeholders. So for aim one, we are to come up and understand what is the gap for this. There are the international standards of TB care, which is a guideline that we adopted as a country in the national TB program. We are saying that for every patient, we need to refer all patients who are suspected of having pulmonary TB. You refer them to the lab. He comes to you as a clinician, you assess him, suspected, refer him to the lab. Then once he goes to the lab, the sputum is tested. And there's an algorithm for testing for sputum, expert, or smear. We examine either two sputum smears if someone is negative, but if he's positive, only one. 
Then immediately finish the examination, initiate TB treatment to that person who is positive. So that's how we looked at M1. And in the methods really, as I said, we looked at 24 sites, which the red are the ones which have the yellow ones are the ones which are referring to those other ones. And we wanted to look at to what extent are they meeting these international standards, all the, the guidelines as they are put down, so that we can be able to get them. And this was done at 24 health centers, linked to 16 testing sites, which I read. So what we did, in terms of collecting data, we looked at the different sources, and we looked at these are registers, which exist. These are Ministry of Health registers in the unit. So we didn't want to really bring new tools and others, otherwise it cannot be easily adopted. So these registers, TB laboratory register, expert vision form and TB treatment register. What we did, we procured some smartphone and trained people at the health facility to capture photos and send them to the Red Hub database. And then our staff extract data and enter it in the database. And then they also work with the health facilities by calling them back to try to look at the sort of any issues of quality. So we are trying to see what's really happening at that unit at that point in time. And we also this in expert alert server, which really helps the ministry monitor how many cartilages and how these materials are. So we, we try to compare the data here to that one for validation purposes. So we looked at our outcome as the quality indicators. What are, are the quality indicators in this case? We looked at proportion of patients undergoing TB evaluation in five hospital. This is along the guidelines, and now we want to say what proportion of those who qualify qualified. Then proportion of patients completing hospital based testing according to the, our national guidelines. And then the indicator theory was proportion treated within 14 days if found to have the disease bacteriologically confirmed. Those are the indicators that we looked at in to address that aim one of our study or work. And from abstracting records from those various health facilities, we managed to have so many patients. Finally, we analyzed 2,594 patients to look at that. And this work was published in some articles which are listed there. What did we find as far as the quality gap is concerned? What we found that before our intervention, this is we are here looking at what is existing at the healthcare facility. Look at the gap. Proportion referred for sputum was 81. That was the range. Proportion completing, proportion treated. However, this is a cumulative probability. This is multiplied by this. We found that cumulative probability of being diagnosed and treated, given that you had TB, was on the there are many people who are not being treated. And so, and the treatment we looked at within 14 days. Yeah. So, as in the beginning, we looked at utilization of gene expert. This is a new tool, a new intervention that had been brought. We wanted to look at its utilization also. And we found that at that point, from that data, we found that 17% of patients referred for expert testing, only 17%. 34 of HIV positive adults, 70% of HIV negative. Less than 5% of patients were referred as their first line test. There is a new tool that has been deployed intervention here to help diagnostic. However, as you can see, it's only less than 5%. Less than 50% of expert positive patients were initiated within 14 days. So 
this already shows you that as much as the intervention is out there, probably it's not performing as it's expected. And then we want to identify those barriers and be able to come up with interventions. So, in summary, what we found in that trying to analyze the gap of that is here I said overall quality of TP diagnostic evaluation at the peripheral center remains suboptimal. Uptake of expert testing at the peripheral centers is limited and leakage of treatment for expert positive patients is inadequate. So that's when we really collected data from these units and see what's going on as a guideline, that's the gap. Based on what we found as the gap, we needed as our aim to understand that quality gap. And we used the conceptual model of the theory of plan behavior. Try to look at intention to follow international standards of TB guidelines, which were adopted as sort of adherence to the guideline and improve case detection and treatment. So we saw that really the things which affect there is the knowledge, attitude, social norms of the clinician. Patient factors will affect this, and also the system factors will affect this. So we went to collect data. We did interview, key format interviews with healthcare workers, field observations. We surveyed patients at six health centers and did qualitative data analysis, transcribed the interviews, and also did some descriptive statistics. What we found with the provider interviews when we interviewed providers, human resource, lack of knowledge about current guidelines. Sometimes the guidelines are out there assumption that people there is need to train people and understand lack of skills microscopic test used to diagnose TB even if that TB evaluation is not again usually people end up saying we shall evaluate this the sample data in the evening but the patient is not there he has gone however much tomorrow we get the results to be not important low self efficacy because of the high workload and low confidence. Material resources, also, the number of them, stockouts, service implementation, high staff tunnel, and service coordination. These are sort of the things which were prominent when we interviewed providers. But we also looked at issues related to patients' pathways. And this is work in the United States published it. Here the patients go through so many before they reach the right diagnosis. More that 80 percent patients had prior visits the same with the same symptoms somewhere else before they reach the health care system. There were high costs of seeking care. And and so in all of this, in terms of patients, they get lost all by the time they get the diagnosis. So, we looked at the health system, still the hub spot model, sputum collection, shortage of sputum containers, sputum transport to expert testing hub, regular sputum transport, one three times a week for the water takes the samples and other things, expert testing. Sometimes the, the machines themselves, they are not all functioning. Fire, uh, lack of power, backup, daily device maintenance not performed, and others. So we found that even the health systems were also barriers. And we needed to go interventions to address these barriers. So to be able to the target barrier, the barriers we found here were we looked at predisposing factors. We used the preceding model to try to come up now with some intervention that we need to test and evaluate. And 
we looked at barriers within the knowledge, time, and resource constraints, enabling factors, which were really the factors of failure of patients to return, consistency, and others, and reinforcing factors. So using this precise model, we developed interventions to address these barriers that we identified into the healthcare system. So, the intervention design process here involved stakeholder involvement. As you can see, some of us are academicians in universities, and they, we need the means to get through maybe the districts and others, because we cannot be able to address some of the barriers. If you are looking at workload and staff, we must work with them. So we had to involve stakeholder consultation and discuss with them. We can provide some academic information, but then they make decisions and also decide on prioritizing which barriers as to then select intervention that we did. So, we came up based on our preceding model and we said we need to single sample a FM DRA. We bought new microscopes and provided to these healthcare facilities. And these were more sensitive, they, you, you have the less time. But what we wanted is here to see that if people have a lot of workload at the unit, they will need to quickly examine. At the same time, we decided that instead of providing two samples as required, they get one sample divided into two, test one and send one, which was single sample. Okay? We decided they execute on transport to expert sites. We actually hired the border borders at each of the units to take samples. And as the samples went there, instead of being desserts back, we used SMS. We took advantage of the techniques. SMS, short message. And then immediately, the sample is tested and it's positive. You send an SMS to the patient, tell him your results back to the facility. But also another result is sent to the healthcare facility. Around the to the Central National TV program about it. So, we sort of it was programmed to make sure that instead of the border border waiting for us to bring them back, once the sample is there, once the machine is tested, the message goes to the patient, go back to the healthcare facility. Your result is back and also goes to the health facilities. That was tried to make sure anybody factors and performance feedback has seen that it was an important thing. So, the intervention. I've already talked about the single sample here, which required provide diagnosis. High laboratory workload is the value we are testing, believe that the evaluation not again. And the intervention details, we had to train people at those healthcare facilities, both testing, and so that we can organize also the workflow within the lab to make sure that things work better. The daily sputum transport. We had made sure that sputum is transported quickly on day, and these are surveyed back using SMS. We were targeting failure of patients to return after initial visit for system based placement transport the testing sites. And those are the intervention between border border rider. So, for SMS based communication, similarly, this is there to reduce delay in reporting results that failure of patients to return and inability to work and call up patients. So the intervention detail was in expert alert software, we sort of installed in expert software at those hubs and also had SMS sent to patients. So we had to report patients' numbers as they provide the samples as well as the message is sent to them when the results are ready and they go back to the unit. Performance feedback was really to say was that a lack of communication and insufficient oversight. So really this was more they wanted to empower the units to be able to discuss these results and be able to plan and improve things at those units. So this in the beginning sent as a report later on they take over and they do it themselves. So this design, the design was really single at five peripheral units, 
and we link them to the hub. They were all adults over the 14 month period as we collected data. The intervention components were those single sample, the sputum transport, SMS based reporting. And the outcomes was the quality indicators which we had identified as gaps. We now want to look at the quality indicators I'm going to see after the implementation and look at those process metrics. This was the data for the patients which we looked at. This was the demographics. But the results for those same quality indicators after implementing over 14 months, proportionally filed for sputum went up. This time it was 80 something, but proportion completing TB testing, proportion tested within 14 days. And so, we realized that this was a serious time by just intervening and addressing some of those quality issues to be improve. And even the new tool, the expert that had been introduced, at that time it was about 17% of senior negative patients in fact. Now we have 91 of those who are fat. 76 was actually that one. So we, we saw there were improvements by just improving the quality of that. And so we looked at the fidelity of our algorithm. The seniors examined, treated on the same day, hospital laboratory transport, and other things. So the fidelity of our algorithm. One of the things that we looked at. This SMS based reporting are things that we have feel SMS was sent to patients and SMS was sent to health facilities. And we now looked at the metrics of getting data and see how many experts performed 100% SMS. But you can see 49% of the patients received the SMS, whereas the health facilities were about. Sometimes people want to do a big business and uh, so work and other things. So there are many challenges that even as you use this IT, sometimes you think you've sent an SMS and someone has got it, but sometimes not so much, so about 49%. Mm -hmm. So, in summary, simple tip, this strategy we found that was feasible. We shared this data with the ministry. Simple TB strategy is effective and that linkage of TB treatment can be further improved. So in conclusion, scale up of new diagnostics alone, any intervention at scale up is unlikely to significantly increase case protection. We will need to understand the other issues that may affect implementation along the provider a system and patient level if you are here to have the impact of any intervention. The system interventions are needed to support effective implementation of new diagnostics and make it clear as we have demonstrated by our implementation science frameworks are useful for designing and evaluating the system interventions to the quality of care. As I said earlier, this work is already in and it's a number of colleagues that we are working with through different and you can find more of the TV work that we are doing on that website and these are colleagues from you see CFDL Garden School of Things okay, the National Program So thank you very much and maybe I'll stop there. questions because I think we can do TB specific questions with for Achilles and then after um, Herbert presents we could do an overall session if that's okay. Hi, uh, thanks very much for that and congratulations on your work. Uh, the, uh, to, for clarity though, this was a diagnostic evaluation, it's not screening, right? It's all, this was always uh, the, prob the evaluation of patients suspected of having TB. Yeah. 
the, I just wanted to quickly to know, is there a role of chest x-rays in this at all, or where did you uh, not use chest x-rays? Yeah, we did not use chest x-ray. One of the challenges we have as far as x-ray is concerned, it's not available. You mm -hmm. see something that is available, but maybe a hospital level at the same time, sometimes they the, the, the films are not there and others. So X day is not available. Okay. Yeah. So I'd like we are, to talk to you afterwards yeah. about the stuff we're doing on that. But thank you. I just wanted to clarify. So Achilles, I have one question. What's the difference between gene expert and what was there before? Okay. Like this because I don't Yeah. Gene expert the, the, the test which was there before which is the sputum smear microscope. Really, you make a smear and have to look the eye. It is sensitivity, it's just 50%. The gene expert is a molecular test, which is 85 sort of, and also can be able to detect multiple resistant TB. Okay. So this is, and this is more of an automated test because you just put a sample into the cartridge and put in the machine and it gives you results within two hours. For sputum smear microscopy, people always had to come back the next day. They said, bring one sample today, bring another sample the next morning so that we check the two samples together. For patients who come <coughs> from farm, they will have taken a bus and maybe left there to be with a neighbor. Tomorrow they will not come back. But this one is like within two hours to have a result. But even with that test which gives you a result within two hours, you find that unless you streamline things in the lab and other things, you are not likely to change the attitude. Because sputum, for example, the labs usually tend to say, we shall examine it later. And the patient will not. <coughs> so as much as you introduce that new test, you may also need to understand how providers provide the service so that you can have sort of a change or an understanding so that they can see the need. Because the key issue is to make sure that people are initiated the treatment quickly. Uh, and, and that's where this new test is. But even despite that new test, if we don't streamline things, we think may not get the impact. Thanks, Dr. Katamba. Um, I'm just wondering if this setting is similar to what I know, it's largely donor driven, and what's characteristic of that system is that indicators tend to change over a number of years. So I'm wondering, over the four years you did this, uh, did you encounter any such problems, and how did you adapt your data collection systems to, for example, the registers changing over time? And uh, as a second question, you talked about uh, the border border riders going daily to pick up samples. I know the usual um, logic behind having them going weekly or once in three days is for efficiency in terms of cost. So are there any thoughts around estimating how much extra that is adding to the cost for this whole system uh, in terms of yeah, the efficiency, cost efficiency of the program? Yeah, we did not go to get that data. That data finally is there, but as far as cost, but we do not anticipate a bigger cost because remember that the border provider takes the samples in the normal system, brings the results back mm -hmm. another time when it comes. We are sending the samples with the border border rider, but the results are taking advantage of the SMS. Many people have a form. And sometimes just sending that SMS, which probably is almost the cost is minimum. So we don't anticipate, but the mere fact that the impact on patients initiated on treatment in a timely manner. One of the challenges that South Africa, when Gene Expert came out, he has spent the biggest amount of money among all the countries. It sort of centralized Gene Expert and even did our with sputum smear microscope in South Africa government spent a lot of money. However, the impact on mortality and mobility was not there. Mm -hmm. Because what they did in South Africa, they over-centralized mm -hmm. 
the testing. They said, let's have a 16 module machine here, a 64 module machine here. Let the samples be sent to here for testing. The samples will come centrally, they are tested, and the results are taken back to those units. The patients were not there. We've had the test positive, but the patients did not initiate a review. So finally, they realized that this over-centralization, and so on. On the first question, which is related to data, adjusting your systems the, the, to no, change in the case. Yeah, there, there was no changes. You know, these <coughs> registers are sort of like standard. And the, if there is any change, it may be small, but usually if they are not changed regularly because it's very expensive to print new registers and change them. So we didn't encounter any changes. Yeah. But we were here fo focusing on also particular data points, variables, so that even if there was a change, we could still capture the information like age, sex, what, and all that. <clears throat> Thank you, Achilles. Um, so I have a question. I mean, the results are really impressive. My question is sort of one about durability. And, you know, the, the nickname we use is Hawthorne effect, that the act of observation changes the observed. In physics, they call that the Heisenberg principle. So are you, do you have any plans to go back now that the implementation phase is over and check that these results are being maintained when, once the research is finished? Yeah. We, it, it is sometimes very difficult yeah. really to, to say that to what extent, because there is that impact because the work is going on, the health facilities are participating. Yeah. Whether at the end of the key issue we are trying to do is usually to have minimal involvement as we go along mm -hmm. so that there's health facility staff in the beginning like example we will discuss the reports report with them but later on just send the report by email and then see whether they continue to work on that it is a very difficult thing in these settings where we are we are now doing a programmatic trial right. which is really comparing one module expert. After finding out this, the gaps, we applied for funding to compare one module, which is called, Cephid has put out to age. It's now one module. So we have pressed one module, gene expert, at these spokes, which we <coughs> find. So at 10 of the spokes, we pressed and the other, we left them referring samples. So we have a trial going on which is ending in March, which has been going on for some time. And we are going to compare to see whether it's important to continue referring or to buy new one module experts at all those lower experts. Mm -hmm. But I fully agree with you that uh, Oh, it is not easy, and yeah. uh, you cannot guarantee that it will be there. But you, yeah. you hope when you empower the staff, yeah. be involved the more over time. Yeah. Yeah. And also by involving the ministry to see that mm -hmm. they continue to support this. But it's a very difficult issue. Yeah. I'm curious about um, co-infections for TB and how they may have affected or impacted your implementation phase. So with um, HIV, TB co-infections, which, um, which is most popular, and um, with the ramp up that has been going on with HIV in recent times, what did you see, what was that effect on your work? Was that, did that amplify your findings or did it mask some of the findings that you could have had from your own implementation? I think one of the things that in our units, if someone is HIV infected, there is sort of supposed to be screened regularly, and that sample is still sent to this lab to be taken. So I don't think there would be an effect. So because we had HIV infected patients in that, and we had also non-HIV infected. The algorithm for HIV infected says that 
for every person who is HIV infected, the sample should be sent for gene expert testing. But for someone who is HIV negative, the sample can be used by this other test, sputum simia microscope. Hmm? So we're trying to also evaluate and see to what extent do people adhere to the guideline for sending these samples. But we still found that they did not adhere very much to, to the guideline because they did not refer those samples as required. However, the testing, there is nothing like saying for HIV, all the samples go to the same lab. Yeah. I don't know whether it answers your question or not. So did you think that it helped with um, the outcomes that you found after implementation, or do you think that there may have been some masking because HIV patient samples are treated with priority or category? No, I don't think in the lab they are treated with priority. They may not have had anything. There is no priority for, test, for testing. Once it's a sputum sample, the lab people usually would say, we handle sputum in the afternoon, irrespective of whether it came because there's no lab that is testing for those who are HIV infected, all those testing, all samples, prongas who are suspected of TB, it's the same place. And samples. Thank you, Achilles. So Herbert, do you want to take the floor? <laughs> to let you guys know that um, UBC Okanagan is involved in this session um, and we are live streaming to different parts of the UBC community as well. I, I failed to mention that. Um, so I'm hoping that there are people engaged on the net. Thanks, Herbert. So I'm glad to be here <coughs> and uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Spilo who invited us. Uh, to, to share what uh, we do in Uganda. Now, um, uh, Achilles has uh, discussed implementation science research. And um, what I'm going to discuss in this case is, is to see whether we can use this knowledge is generated in the HIV uh, population study in the area in Guru. So I'm just going to share this is not, there is no implementation science implemented here, but we want to learn from this to see how we can apply it to, to this uh, study. So the study is called HIV Changoli uh, Edge. Project in northern Uganda. Changoli H is a Luo phrase which means healing the elephant. Healing the elephant. We use this phrase because it makes it so easy for the community to understand the complexity of our project. Because the symbol, the, the symbol for this population in Ikulu, actually people is the elephant. I don't know the, the symbol for Canadians. <laughs> there is any animal that represents the Canadians. Maybe the dove. Well, we use beavers and Canada geese. We have a few animals. Animal. You have? Yeah, geese. we have like two, I think two animals. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's bee. good. Huh? And a bee. Yeah, and a maple leaf. <laughs> and yeah. Okay, for, for these people in northern Uganda, it is the elephant. And when you talk of healing the elephant, that means you are trying to get a solution to many of their problems. And in this case, the elephant that is sick is the actual community. It is sick of HIV, and all these interventions, all these efforts, all the research is aimed at healing it. This is the idea here. Um, now, uh, some of you have been in, in Uganda, or some of you are young, uh, <laughs> been in Gulu, and um, um, 
This place I'm talking about has suffered, this population has suffered civil war for over two decades. And um, many of them, the people were displaced into the uh, displacement camps for a period of over six years, 16 years, and they experienced a lot of torture. As you can see, uh, there were experiences of rape, torture, mutilation, destruction of property, and people were also abducted, including children. The social economic infrastructure was weakened, and the social fabric was kind of lost. The infrastructure, especially in this case when we talk of infrastructure, we focus more on health care facilities. The health facilities they were in many ways uh, destroyed. On top of that, because of the conflict or because of the violence in the conflict, there's a lot of widespread trauma. So many studies have shown the high burden of mental disorders in this area. And depression, for example, goes up to 24.7%. And PTSD was measured to be over 10%, which is quite high. However, that situation was overcome in 2006. The war kind of ended, and there was <coughs> relative peace and people need to move back to their communities, uh, marking a transition from the camps back to the communities. That one is also another challenging situation, very challenging setting. Uh, in the camps, to tell you that, uh, briefly about what was happening in camps, in the camps, it was a bad place, but in terms of services, it was a good place in one way. Because people were concentrated in one area, it was easy to target them with interventions. Going back to the community, to the villages, it became a different story. Uh, people found it really, really challenging to access care. Even now, they do find it a challenge to access care. In Uganda, we have Proven, proven HIV intervention policies. I'm bringing in this because we are talking about intervention, uh, intervention implementation science research. Implementation science research is about using approved or proven methods, proven policies, proven interventions to apply them to the community. Uganda has a number of uh, intervention, um, HIV intervention policies, and uh, one of them is, and this is the one I'm going to focus on, is the antiretroviral therapy. There was health education in the beginning, including the ABC approach. I hope you are aware of the ABC approach. It is abstain, be faithful, and use a condom if you cannot. Uh, that is the ABC approach, which was very popular. And actually, our president was invited by President Bush uh, in the United States. And he was applauded because of implementing this approach. The, the, another policy is voluntary testing and counseling and medical male circumcision of recent. However, for purposes of, this, for purposes of this discussion, I'm going to concentrate on use of art or antiretroviral therapy. Currently, it is the, uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, the policy in Uganda is test and treat. Everybody who tests HIV positive, as of now, starts on uh, ARV or ART treatment immediately. The government also has rolled out the Option B program 
aimed at uh, stopping the vertical transmission, mother to, to child transmission. This is the main policy existing now. There have been so many advantages uh, that have come with the use of ARVs or at it prolongs life through improved immunity. It reduces the risk of acquiring HIV. It has proven that it can reduce HIV transmission up to 96%. Through the treatment as, uh, treatment as prevention. Actually, it was the Canadian professor who mm -hmm. came up with this. Um, yes. So it also eliminates mother-to-child transmission and reduces transmission among discordant couples. Couples who, one of them is positive, another one is HIV negative, positive, another one HIV positive. In Uganda, for example, AIDS-related mortality reduced by over 50% in one year. Yes, when we started using art. Worldwide, AIDS-related deaths also have fallen by 45% since uh, it was rolled out widely. <coughs> Fewer people are dying uh, compared to before art. And it's also cost-effective in that uh, HIV becomes like diabetes or hypertension or it is, it, it is no longer a stigmatizing, uh, burdening disease. It's just as long as somebody takes medication regularly, can live like any other person. The target of ARVs is the 90-90-90. I think we are aware of the 90-90 the policy. This is the, um, this aims at eliminating HIV by 2030. We don't know. But that is the target. This target requires that 90% of HIV positive people uh, need to be screened or need to know their HIV status. 90% of all those diagnosed receive uh, antiretroviral. 90% of all those diagnosed should get treatment or should start at, and 90% of all people on at should be virally suppressed. Viral suppression is when uh, the HIV virus can no longer be detected in the blood uh, stream. So this is the target. However, both HIV uh, prevalence and incidence in northern Uganda is high. They are high, higher than the national average. We observe a high HIV incidence rate of 10.2 uh, per thousand person year among people who have survived the war. This is 2.5. This is. 2.5 times higher, can you imagine, higher um, than the national estimates five years ago. This shows that actually it is really, really very high in this population. HIV prevalence is also 12.2, way higher than the average, the national average. Research shows that uh, there's also trauma. Uh, trauma, one of the issues that may explain this high HIV prevalence and incidence is the trauma because of the war and the conflict. Um, for example, women who experienced war-related sexual violence were 80% 80, 80 more likely to be HIV positive. 80%. 
the population face um sorry the population faces tremendous difficulties accessing effective prevention and health care services and less than 35 percent of hiv positive uh, people uh, access care uh, compared to 85 percent of the rest of the country on average What does this mean? This means that uh, just having effective intervention or policies will not make the target population healthier. As we have seen, <coughs> the Uganda government has all these policies proven. They have good intervention programs, but the incidence and the prevalence rates in Northern Uganda are still way high unacceptably high. Therefore, there is need to identify the challenges that affect access to care and develop and test the interventions. So we are thinking of implementing, uh, uh, implement, doing the implementation science research in this, trying to see where is the problem. These policies are there but the, our figures are still way, way high. So can we, can implementation science help us get the solutions? So we look at this putting, um, as putting a decision into effect. We are not going to look at all these policies and try to see how we engage them um, in our project. So what is the problem? Often research projects focus on small scale studies with assumptions that findings can be generalized. That's what we do when we go for studies. We cut out a sample, a small sample, a small study, with hope that the findings can be generalized. However, the challenge comes at that very stage. Many of us carry out this, way. we publish, we write good reports, sometimes we even write books, <laughs> but the implementation mm -hmm. is not possible. Uh, this is because of sometimes, even when it comes, it delays, it comes very late. Sometimes it comes in a, a different form when it has changed. Sometimes it comes at a very high cost, and sometimes uh, some writer on uh, implementation has calls it a, a no-do a, a no do gap, whereby research is done and it hasn't had any impact. No implementation out of it is done. So implementation science research, therefore, uh, studies barriers to methods of promotion, promoting and promoting systematic application of research findings into practice for particular setting. And the most important part here is particular setting. Because the interventions that may work in Canada may not work in Northern Uganda. Even in Northern Uganda, the intervention policies, HIV intervention policies that have worked very well in the South are not working in the South. The data are showing that they are not working in Northern Uganda. So, for a particular city, it's about uptake of proven evidence. Yes, implementation, you must have evidence that the intervention works or the policy works. Then you take it to, you apply it to your target population. In the context of healthcare, it addresses bottlenecks. We hope it will help us to address bottlenecks, identify optimal approaches, and to promote uptake uh, of our research findings in our study um, to improve health care and its and delivery. 
So what are the uh, what are the barriers? Uh, uh, we are trying to address. What barriers do you, do we plan to address? The first one is the impact of trauma, mental illness. It is a problem. Uh, maybe Yanni has been in Gulu. In Gulu, you don't have to move a lot before you see somebody who is mentally sick. Um, they are all over. It is a big, big problem. Suicide uh, rates are very high. Um, violence and all those. Um, so the impact of trauma is one of the challenges. Then we have the invisibilities, what we have called invisibilities. Um, this, we call them invisibilities because these are very important issues, but often missed out in statistics. Uh, they're not captured statistically, and therefore they are not fed into policy intervention planning. Uh, here we have examples of uh, marriage practices. For example, in this community I'm talking about, there is what we call uh, widow inheritance. If, 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 if I'm your brother, if my, I'm, I'm Achilles' brother and I die, Achilles is supposed to inherit my wife. Uh, because the practice is that has to look after the children and all that. So it's not only about property, but also the wife. Uh, even in marriage practices, there is what we call bride price. So many, we are trying to do a study where we, we have new cases, people who are converted, but we are trying to get the qualitative understanding of the circumstances in which at baseline they did not have HIV, but at one point they get HIV. We're trying to understand, but the study, there are some of the studies are showing that actually bride price, for example, uh, a young man cannot marry without paying a number of cows or gifts to the parents. And that one also, there is a way <coughs> it, it has led to separation of young men or young people or they have been forced to go with people they don't want simply because they have property or they are forced to separate because they can't pay. Uh, <coughs> so these are invisibilities that are not captured in the numbers, in the figures, but are very key. They are, they are very big drivers. Uh, they are very dri big drivers of HIV. Fertility values. Um, now this one is a challenge with adolescent girls. Adolescent girls where many children were born with HIV through vertical transmission. So when they reach the age of uh, adolescence or marriage, um, they are advised, uh, some of them are advised to wait or to not to have children, but due to social pressures or the values of how do you die without a child, you have to produce a child, you know. So <coughs> those are some of the invisibilities. But reality, gender violence, ETC. Medical supply gaps, we have already, this one is very common. Um, the necessary drugs and other supplies in the health facilities are lacking in many ways. Lack of lab infrastructure, shortage of trained human resources. But in this case, we plan to work with stakeholders, government, community, uh, local governments, to see how we can address or fill these, these gaps. So, The question often is, what do we do to change this kind of situation. That's the biggest question. And how do we get there? You know, who can do what? And how and how do we capture the outcomes? Like we are learning from Achilles the way he 
he did his interventions and then the way he captured the outcomes. We plan to apply that. So in doing this, this is the, the study, the conceptual framework for the study we are implementing in Northern Uganda. Um, the main input is the, the idea is to develop and test culturally safe, strength-based, trauma-informed technology enhanced interventions in Uganda. This is what we intend to do. And right now we are at baseline level. We hope starting from next year we shall try to, we shall start uh, planning for the interventions. And there are two main interventions we are looking at. The first one is uh, we are also going to use mobile phones or e-health in this community. And two, we are going to use what we call the Wayonero. Now, this is the Luo phrase, another one. This is the uncle, the anti uncle approach. Uh, it is um, traditionally the Acholis respect elders, and the anti and the uncle are key personalities in one's life. Uh, and we want to explore that value for the traditional and respect for the traditional system to see how we can use this system to intervene in the health needs of especially the young people, uh, adolescents and even other, use it in other conditions. This study is an open cohort. Um, in which uh, we have over 3,000 individuals, 13 to 49 years, enrolled in four districts of Bulu. Uh, we do follow up on an annual basis, and each of the individuals gives a blood sample on which we do tests, especially HIV, syphilis, and uh, hepatitis B. Um, we also administer questions. We, we, we monitor the behavior and to monitor the behavior and or other issues. So we use a multi uh, a multi method approach. We use the epidemiology, ethnography and uh, uh, psychometrics and uh, all different uh, resilience uh, To get to this. So the objective, uh, these are the objectives, but the most important one is the still to develop and test culturally safe. We want to say culturally safe. That's why we are going for the wires and narrows. Strength best. That's why we are bringing in the, the technologies. Trauma informed, because trauma is a challenge there. Uh, technology enhanced interventions. So we hope we are going to do this by bringing in the element of implementation science at the end of the day. Because the, we, we think by introducing implementation science from the word go, we shall be able to patch these gaps that may exist when it comes to utilizing our, uh, our findings or implementing our findings. Expected outcome, our hope is to enhance the innovations to enable expansion of evidence-based interventions to contribute towards the national goal of the 1990-90 target of 2030. However, our focus is um, examining the factors leading, uh, factors leading uh, of the 10, okay, the UNAIDS policy is targeting the 1990-90. In this project, we want to focus so much on the 10, 10, 10. Reason is because, as you have seen, Northern Uganda, the population, uh, given the incidence and the prevalence, those high, they are in the 10, 10. They are in the 10, 10. They are not in the 90, 90. 
So we want really to focus on the 10, 10, 10 to see how we can apply implementation science to achieve our objectives. And I finally, I, I stated here, <coughs> while it, uh, HIV has become chronic in the rest of the country, it's not the case in Northern Uganda. Uh, it's not, it's still really a, a, a big challenge. So I have no conclusion because <laughs> it is a, just a plan to go. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Herbert. I think the, the plan was at five for people who have to go home. Um, we were going to take a, a ten minute break, but I we've gone a little bit over. So if there's people that have to go, if you want to you can for sure get up and go. And maybe we'll set up for the panel sure. and then have the all the questions then if that's yeah, okay. That's yeah, right. we'll do that quickly. Yeah. Or you can have panel questions while we set up. Or you just go ahead, guys. Yeah. Like, if we want a yeah. bio break or if you want to go, please. And then Mark and Yann. Yeah. So you guys are the panels. <laughs> <laughs> teaching in Uganda, and, and recently, over the last five years or so, I've been going to Gulu to work in the regional referral hospital to help with some of the patient care there and supervision of interns. And, and uh, there, there's a lot of, of TB and, and, thing, and HIV as well. Um, I have tried some projects, some small research projects, um, and, and some of the ones were, you know, a question was about that linking to care. That HIV care was there, TB care was there, and sometimes there was a miss, and sometimes even the medications, one person wouldn't know that they were on a particular medication. The, the, the thing working in both settings, the thing that strikes me the most is, is the stockouts and, and not having things. But, you know, that, that here we're so well resourced. We have lots of nurses, colleagues, if I have a case, there's, there's so many. If, if I'm sick, there's someone else I can, and, and to not have something, here, you know, if, if there's a delay in two minutes in getting a test, I'm already frustrated. Or the, but, but, but sometimes, it, and it's so challenging for me to work in a, a setting without certain resources. And, and then it, it's hard as a clinician, sometimes you feel it's out of your, your, your realm. And you think, this is the way you should do it, and how to address it. And I, I like the idea of implementation science. I, I've known it as operational research. And I think maybe there are some differences there that... that about how to, to have to implement it, but uh, so in a nutshell, that's my background. And, and I, I really, I was, I feel very lucky to be here today because I'm, I'm learning things, and it's also nice to meet colleagues. I, I've met Patty and, and, and Dr. Fiddle before in, in Uganda, 
And uh, so it's also a very nice opportunity. Martin? Um, <coughs> no, Martin Schechter, I, <coughs> I've been hanging around this school for a while. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I am involved in the project. Patricia got me involved, and I've spent time in Uganda with these gentlemen and with our colleagues there. It's been an amazing experience. Oh, um, <coughs> well, one thing I thought I could talk about was sort of a learning experience I had about something counterintuitive. So I didn't know what to expect when I got involved, but I kind of felt that these people in northern Uganda had been through this 20-year war. There's all this terrible stuff that happened. And um, now that things were opening up and people were moving back to their villages, I guess I thought, from the HIV point of view, things would get better, right? Not so. So that was the first lesson, is that it's counterintuitive to some degree. But basically, that area was, I don't want to use the word protected by the war, but the influence of HIV was lessened because people were traveling through the area and <coughs> basically confined. Um, the kids who were abducted um, were in the Lord's Resistance Army. I don't think a lot of them acquired affection there. So it counterintuitively, so what happens is the war ends and um, people start moving back to their villages. So two things happen. One is a girl who's like 17 years old has been in a camp her entire life, never learned you know, traditional agriculture or how to live in a village with cattle. And, so they had no um, means to survive. So they turned to sex work. The second factor about the war ending was the truck routes opened up and from South Sudan and across. And for those of you who may remember way back in the beginning of AIDS in the 80s and 90s, we, the epidemiologists were sort of tracking the expansion of AIDS and it was all along the truck routes. Right? And so that was, always, that was just a surprise to me, that it was backwards from what I would have originally thought, that the risk of HIV was actually enhanced. I mean, a lot of things are better, but from that one particular point of view, it's not better, and that's why the project's so important. You know, a 10, it's almost 11 per 1,000 person years is a ridiculously high incidence rate. That's like 1%. So that means every year you take 100 of these young people, when you, one gets infected. It doesn't take long. 10 years, you've got a prevalence of 10% or so. And so that's unacceptable. And, um, and it's higher, as we know, than in the rest of the country. And I think it's because of all the things that we, we just discussed. So that was, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. This is awesome to have all of you here. Um, my name is Farah Shroff, and I have worked in Kenya and Uganda and Nigeria. Some of the work that I did was in HIV. And I'm wondering if you, if any of you could just comment on, say, the regional differences, because I have noticed a fairly big regional difference between, say, generally, um, West Africa seems to have been able to handle HIV rates a little bit more effectively than East Africa in general, and Kenya seems to have been um, not as good as Uganda. <laughs> and it seems that we were just starting this conversation about how um, Tasso and a lot of really effective indigenous um, approaches to, to looking at HIV, like I thought they were addressing some of the things that you mentioned, but you, you kind of glossed over because you were talking about um, ART therapy, but I thought TASO was actually addressing all of those other gaps that you were mentioning earlier, looking at traditional practices, looking at counseling, being really culturally safe. I thought the practices that they were implementing looked really culturally safe, really trauma-informed, like all the things that you were mentioning. I saw that um, in action in, in, the, in the services that I saw in a few different parts of Uganda. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, about the first question of the regional difference, um, maybe Patricia would help. Uh, I'm just thinking in Kiwi. Oh, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just can't tell us. Um, I, I don't know. Probably because of uh, it could be because of religion. Yes. 
uh, because um, much of West Africa, um, proper than Muslims, Next, yeah. a big part of Nigeria, for example, and, yeah. um, uh, and uh, studies have shown that actually even in Uganda, studies have shown that prevalence among the Muslims is much lower. Um, um, and the, in countries, even when you look at other countries, for example, which are predominantly Muslim, HIV prevalence is very low, uh, including Somalia that has violence all the time, but prevalence is very low, uh, Nigeria. So probably, I, I'm not saying, but it could be that. Um, um, about Kenya and Uganda, yes, um, there could be, I don't know the prevalence, levels in Kenya, uh, but uh, there could be a difference, you may be right, that there are differences between Uganda and Uganda um, stepped up interventions early enough in the early 1980s. Um, uh, this was because the government in, in the power today, they, they came to power through uh, uh, fighting, uh, they came from the bush. So as they were in the bush, of course, many of them uh, got infected with HIV. They didn't know. They, they, were, they didn't have information about protection. They didn't. So many of them got uh, HIV. When they captured power, they just realized that many of them were sick. So the government decided to start intervention early. After the first hospital or the first HIV hospital initiated in Uganda was a military hospital. Uh, by clinical, joint clinical research center, JCRC, yes, yes, yes. was there to, to, to treat the military. But that background helped the rest of the country. Uh, they just realized that uh, um, it was a big problem and they rolled out the interventions to the rest, mainly education, uh, Treatment was not there at that time, but there was a lot of education, there was a lot of counseling. TASO came in place, mm -hmm. screening mm -hmm. services. So there were some interventions that started earlier, probably earlier than in Kenya. Yeah. That would be the, the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think I'm not very much in the numbers of the HIV and TB, but he, one thing that he when the president came in power, if you look at Kenya and Uganda, yeah. as he said, when their president came in power, mm -hmm. the first place he did was to send his soldiers, well, this is a story, he sent his soldiers for military training in Cuba. Mm -hmm. At that time it was Fidel Castro, right. was the leader. Yeah. That was 1986. So first thing he said, most of my people are not military, they trained, they need training. So he talked to Fido Castro and he sent the soldiers to Cuba. When they reached, he yeah. said, yeah. then he sent them there. Fido Castro screened them for HIV. Mm -hmm. And he said, these ones are not coming to Kenya. I'm sending them back. They are HIV infected. So he, he opened his head and said, oh, as much as we have other wars to fight, there is a war for HIV. So that's how it opened up to the world that I have a problem here. That's why you see there are many people who came to Uganda to address this. Whereas Kenya kept quiet. Yeah. And I think some people say they kept quiet because their tourism industry was booming and other things. But Uganda was very open about. Yeah. And that's why I found that it went because the political leadership felt there is a problem and it opened up. I, I, and that was a very big contributing factor to try to do APCD because at that time there was nothing as far as ARD is concerned. It was really abstinence, be faithful, common use, those were the first interventions. Yeah. And I think that may be one of the issues which also Stefan, is there anybody that has questions online? Not yet. Not yet? No. Thank you very much. Very educational. Um, much of my research is in the Canadian context, so I'm really interested in learning more about the benefits of the partnership between UBC researchers 
and researchers in Uganda, or clinicians from Canada in the Ugandan context. What, what, I know you have long-standing relationships, but what's been the benefit of that partnership uh, to, to advancing the research agenda, I guess? <laughs> you have to speak. I think it's, we've um, been working together, so it's been over uh, two decades now, um, with the partnership between um, us and UBC and um, McCary. And, um, I think the capacity enhancement piece has been really important for us. Um, when we got the foundation grant, which is now like a seven year grant, um, we're worried about um, the people that we're working with and training. So we have a large team in the field that at least 30 people work for, for Changoliet currently. Um, and because we're, we're not an office-based cohort study, we're a, we're a, a community-based. So um, we have a large team and our focus for um, Northern Uganda has been shock protection and um, you know long-term commitment to um, capacity enhancement um, for our teams, and that includes you know, supporting the research capacity. Yeah, and um, so we've got uh, people who have trained with us over time, um, and when we first started the study, we were more concerned about the relationship between the North and the South internally rather than the relationship between Canada and Uganda. Mm -hmm. Because the North and the South were really separate during the war because it lasted for so long. So like you couldn't, there's a part of the, where you cross the Nile going to Northern Uganda and many people wouldn't go past that part of the Nile because of the, the atrocities committed during the conflict. And so you would see um, there was a part of the war where the Lord's Resistance Army was mutilating women. So they would um, send out a notice saying, you can't go to the market to this day to one displacement camp. So women who would go to the market had their lips cut off. Ooh. But what would happen at that time was, because there was such a divide between the North and the South, we would see plastic surgeons flying in from Norway, for example, to help. But we didn't see that um, because people really feared what was going on in the north. So, because there had been so much capacity built by um, MRC Chamolivia, Chamolivia, and the Rakai project, which is was really largely NIH funded for a really long time, those guys committed to a joint, um, a Choli, like our northern leaders and our southern leaders to work together to to focus on the North, because many people in the South wanted to help, but didn't know how. So that was our focus. So we have less Canadians involved and far more Ugandans involved from all across the country. So that was our kind of commitment to, to that piece. And it, it has been awesome, because as you realize that, you know, the Rocket Project started in 1984, was led by Dr. Nelson Combo. So he committed to, um, bringing the Rakai experience to the North, which had no evidence-based research for HIV at the time. It was all NG NGO reports. And so I think we're, we're the first cohort um, in post-conflict, I think, globally, to my knowledge. Um, and so that having that North-South collaboration has been critical um, internally, I think. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have a question about the, the sort of one of the fundamental things that one needs to do in implementation science, which is uh, that the at some l more local level, the people who are implementing health services need to have the freedom to change things in order to find the locally appropriate solutions, right? And, um, and one of the problems in many countries is they have nationally driven policies and programs which are very uniform and there's very limited ability at the local level to change things. Even most of the money 
is not even handled at the local level, like all the salaries are paid from a central source. Often drugs and supplies are simply distributed and there's not actually a purchasing element there. What's the situation in Uganda in terms of, um, I mean, if one is going to scale up, partially what one wants to scale up is not a particular set of solutions, but a capacity to find solutions, right? And how, what's been your experience with that? Capacity to? Find solutions. In other words, the thinking of implementation science is to understand the local context and find the right solutions, right? So it's not that one solution here is going to be the same there. Yeah. But how, do one, how does one create that uh, uh, in a public system, that <coughs> ability to find those solutions? Yeah, and maybe uh, I'd like to answer that by giving an example. You know, in the beginning, there used to be this issue of for example, our countries which are following WHO guidelines, whenever WHO put out something, it was this one size fit all approach. And many things finally were found out that probably as much as they thought it fits all, it may not fit. And in a way, it was important to try to tailor out most of these things as much as they are evidence-based to the local setting by giving the local people a chance to see what can be done and within the setting. And in that case, for example, there was a WHO policy which came out which was saying, you know, we have always tried to do TB case finding using what we call passive case finding. You wait for a patient to come to the clinic and then you screen those who come. However, after realizing and even in many of the modeling studies and others finding that if we are to achieve the targets we want to achieve, like the 2035 NPB strategy that is there, really our approach has to change by looking at active, let's go out there and look for patients instead of waiting for patients to come to the units. Otherwise, by the time they come, they have transmitted the disease to so many people and so. And in so doing that, they came up with that guideline. But we went out and said, okay, this guideline, you have not told us how well to implement it within our setting. <coughs> We need to work with our national programs and see what would be the best way given the resources we have to really do active case finding and follow up. The, 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 the cheap way would be that go out there, find this patient who is the index who came to the unit, follow him in his home, screen people who may be presumptive, tell them to go to the healthcare facility for further screening. That's the cheap way and probably afford it. But the other way would mean that once you find them there, give them transport to go to, to the units to be able to be screened. It's expensive. However, many times patients come to the hospital when they have pain. People may be moving out with their swellings and others. They never come to the unit until he has pain found me in the home, I'm not, as much as I've been coughing, but I don't have any pain to go to the unit, so why should I go? So we wanted to compare these two strategies and we had to put in input of the people and discuss and see what would be the best way and try to test these two. So in one or another in that, uh, the thinking of the people, to me, goes in and the way it goes in, it, to what extent you, as an academician, involve the stakeholders. And the stakeholders are mainly Ministry of Health officials, program people, who really know the day-to-day -day implementation. There are so many interventions that appear to be good, even based on 
either theory informed and you try to come up with those interventions. But the question is that some of them are not feasible given the resources that exist in the setting. However, by engaging, engaging people, they can tell you, for that, let's do this. For that, let's do this. Because unless you put that thinking, and, uh, and I think right from the beginning, you have the idea you need to present to, to these people and you brainstorm uh, and see what is doable unless you don't want it to be implemented. Then in the middle of the pool, once you come up and say these are the barriers we have identified, you call another stakeholders meeting and say this is what we think, theoretically we think this is, could be solutions, how do we work on that? So to me, I think that thinking is becoming more and more, but uh, as you also may have done, Prof, you've done a lot of global work, as you said, but sometimes, <clears throat> whatever level can you say, whatever comes in, but you, you need to sit down with the people and try to see through and see what might be feasible within a resource limited setting within this. Yeah, and it is a challenge of that. But, but I think in implementation sense, what we have found that right from the beginning, even before I put together the grant application, it's important that he, he, you discuss some of the ideas and even some of the problems uh, and you see how you can fit some of the ideas of the program if what we want them to impact any of the people's lives in the setting where you are conducting the work. Okay. Oh, thanks again. Um, given that, I'm just going to write on what you've talked about. Uh, given that much of the HIV and TB program is largely donor funded and majority of the current <coughs> implementation is largely driven by the NGOs or implementing partners. Um, I'm wondering, and of course there's well-documented evidence that there's some form of positive reporting bias, either because you want to secure, or the NGOs want to secure, you know, further funding lines. I'm wondering what's the role of academia and people like you in ensuring that this picture is, you know, a lot more balanced and things that don't work actually out there for people to work. Yeah, it's more of trying to say that to what extent are we auditing what others are doing? Uh, in a way, yeah, but also telling or balancing the story because there seems to be some form of positive bias where lots of the reports are about things that work, things that do fantastically well, but we don't now know what doesn't work. And I'm asking, what's your role in ensuring that we now know what doesn't work as much as we know what works? It's a difficult question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think you say the people, the any depots in Uganda, their reports, uh, I don't look at their reports. Probably they are not reporting to us. <laughs> they are reporting to the, if they are like funded by USID, they are reporting to the USID, if they are reporting to the other. It, 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 I, I, I will be contemplating if I tell you that they are report service. But maybe I can attempt. <laughs> so, uh, you say, what is our role as uh, academicians? Yeah. Okay, I mean, of course, um, any any project uh, implementation it has um, it has its well laid out implementation arrangement organization. It has goals. It has indicators. It has evaluation systems. So uh, I, w I would think that you follow that, but to come up to say and say this has worked or not worked, as NGOs, for example, uh, in, the, in the world of NGOs, I'm also very naive. I, I don't know uh, how NGOs do that. But, but if for us in the science, of course, it is difficult because your work is going to, you have to publish it. Uh, you have to, you have particular procedures to go through, you have to deal with the ethics, you have to deal with the quality of the work, 
you have to uh, in with uh, at the back of the mind you you have to be sure that you have to publish this work and the the standards are international you know so if you compromise at one level uh, you may find it difficult to, to publish your work um, well, uh, the other side of the NGOs, uh, I don't know, uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, was what, my, my experience for, for the donor-driven, I, I think there are donors there, but the bulk of care, I think, is not donor. I think it's the, the country that's providing the bulk of the care. And, and donors, it is, it is difficult because I think, you know, I work in a government hospital there, and I'm not working in one of the donor hospitals, mm -hmm. and it's extremely challenging. It, it, same with the Ebola response. I worked a bit with MSF, but then I also worked with WHO and governments, and they're the ones that have to take up the slack. And, and don't, sometimes donors come in and they do what they say, uh, Ebola, this is my Ebola unit, I can, uh, I'm doing this a bullet, but other patients, well, that's, that's the government's problem. That's, that's, and, and the government does take up a lot of slack. And the other problem, I think, a bit with so donors is that uh, um, they are appeal to goodwill, and they're like, I, I do it because I want to, I, I feel like I can. But the government, that, that, that they have to do it. That's a, it's, a, it's a right, the government. So that's why I kind of like the government aspect, because people can say, no, like, look, this is not, you're, you're, you're not a donor, you're not doing this because of goodwill, you're doing this because you have to. This is my human right to have access to this kind of the, the, this kind of medical act. Like we're kind of discussing access to these interventions that we know are available, we know work, but people are just not getting access to it. Okay. Last thing, just to mention about my experience, also a bit with Uganda and working there, that I think I, I'm used to this health system where everything where we, we feel it's our right, we're entitled to it. And uh, it's different in, in Uganda, that there's a, a private health care. And I've heard a lot of times, what do you expect? It's, you know, if you want it, you have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, where does that come from? You know, how come, how come we have that? And, and I've heard something about structural adjustment policies that happened mm -hmm. before. And so when, when Uganda became independent, they had no money. They couldn't tax people. Mm -hmm. the, the poor people were, didn't have money. And the, the investors, well, they were foreign investors. You can't really tax them anyway, because they're, they're foreign companies, so you can't tax them. And then so, so then they said, OK, well, then you money. But if we lend you this money, well, you, you can't subsidize health care. You're going to have to charge people for health care. And, and, so, and I think that, that, that caused problems. We didn't have that. When, when, and, and so I think lot, lots of these issues come down to it. Um, and, and a good point about you, you feel powerless. Like some of these hospitals, you're like, well, that, you're kind of socialized for that. I think heard the term so socialized for scarcity. Mm -hmm. I don't have that here. If I, I feel something, I feel like, how come I don't have this test? I deserve the test, I should have it. Whereas it, in Uganda, the, the lab person is like, well, we didn't have it. We, we ordered it, we asked for these tests. Like, you know, you mentioned these, these reagents. Like, sometimes no, re no sputum containers. So you, you have a fancy gene expert machine, but, but now there's no little plastic tube to, to put that sputum into, to, to put into the, the thing. So anyway, lots, of, lots of challenges. And, and I, I, I think from, from the research point of view, the way I kind of thought that that helps sometimes is it sheds light on it. You know, he highlighted the issue that the gene expert machine, the sensitivity and specificity is good, but the issues are some of these kind of operational issues. And, and, and we have the same ones here, last point, in, in Canada. If I, I recently referred someone to a gastroenterologist, and the wait list is six months. But then there's another gastroenterologist down the street who's just opening up their practice, and they maybe have a no wait list. Mm -hmm. But now how do I... It, and I would say, do I spend more money to get more gastroenterologists or kind of make the system a bit more efficient and do this kind of operational mm -hmm. Actually, this, uh, I was recently involved in a small group. We have a, a, a team work for with University of California, San Francisco. Uh, and we, we usually recruit students in this course where I happen to be one of the team leaders. And one of the case studies which was being discussed by these students was about issues of from the general practitioner to get a specialist care. And the delay into the patients could wait as much as six months, clearly see a specialist. And 
even the referral system from the general practitioner to the specialist was sort of a bit vague and the specialist could not understand it. I think in Boston, California started up with some system within California to make sure that they see how can we have an electronic file uh, and they sort of engaged both the specialist and also the practitioners to discuss how the system to reduce that. that you could see the issues of quality that is affecting that side are different from the issues affecting us, the other side. But you could see patients delay in really seeing a specialist and they found out that probably they create an electronic system where they use a referral system and agree on what needs to be said so that and also the reimbursement system was also a challenge because some physicians felt that by if you consult a specialist he needs to be reimbursed even if he just sends you a consultation and you see the patient that's the general practitioner. And so all that had to be resolved that if you send me and I'm a specialist and you send me this electronic and I give you to discuss, then there is also reimbursed for his time. So you could find the whole system of quality, the issue of quality may be at a different level. And this model actually has been extended to many parts of the US through that system to improve how you make sure that people are quickly get specialist care at the same time quality and all the teams involved, both the general practitioner and the specialist care. Is there any other Maybe one more question, or are we good? Everybody's good? Peter, if you want to. I'm good. You're good? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <coughs> Please join me in thanking you. Can you